Hello and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. I'm Andrew Parks, the Program Coordinator for Lectures and Seminars. We'd like to thank you all for joining us here today in our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. For those in-house, we'd like to take this opportunity to remind you to silence any cell phones. For those watching online, you're welcome to submit questions by emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting today's program is Luke Coffey. Luke is the Margaret Thatcher Fellow in the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom here at the Heritage Foundation. And with that, we'll begin our program. Luke. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone, to the Heritage Foundation. Um, uh, firstly, I, I want to point out that as it's snowing outside here in Washington, D.C., and it's below freezing, it's actually approaching 70 degrees and sunny in Gibraltar. So we're, we're very lucky to have the chief minister and the deputy chief minister uh, who's in um, the audience today here with us and, and his team. Um, Gibraltar is a uh, small, rocky peninsula, about two and a half square miles off the Iberian coast, which has a small land border with Spain. It's a British overseas territory in the same way that Puerto Rico is a territory um, to the United States. It was uh, captured by a joint Anglo-Dutch force in 1704 and was later formally handed over to Great Britain with the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713, and it has been uh, British ever since. Since then, Spain has tried three times to recapture the rock by military force, um, and it continues to this day to <clears throat> claim the rock as its own. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, the people um, of Gibraltar clearly want to be British. They voted twice on this issue in recent times, and each time they voted 98% or higher to remain British. Um, and it's this right of self-determination that um, Gibraltarians um, exercise still to this day. Due to uh, political and economic problems in Spain, the uh, current Spanish government has chosen to divert attention from domestic problems onto what's going on with Gibraltar once again. And just one example of this is that in, in 2013, last year, there were 446 illegal incursions by Spanish state vessels, so Spanish police, Spanish Navy, etc., into uh, British Gibraltarian waters. Um, compare this to 2011 when there were only 23. So why does this matter to Americans? Well, America, firstly, was a is a country that was founded on the ideas of self-determination and sovereignty. And these are two issues that most Americans instinctively support. And this, on top of the special relationship we have with the United Kingdom, means that this is an issue that we should have our eye on and that we should um, be aware of. But perhaps more importantly, the United States has used Gibraltar's strategic location to ensure um, regional security in the Mediterranean area. Um, from 1801, uh, which was um, the first time the U.S. Navy used Gibraltar as part of the first Barbary Wars, to 2011, which is um, the most recent conflict that the U.S. has used uh, the bases at Gibraltar for, which was the intervention into Libya, and everything pretty much in between, the U.S. has used um, the bases at Gibraltar. Uh, most significantly, um, Eisenhower actually planned Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa from Gibraltar, which he said in his book would not have been possible if it wasn't for the access that he had to um, the, the facilities there. So it, it clearly benefits um, the U.S. that uh, Gibraltar remains British because the U.S., from if you want to call it a very selfish point of view, would have access to that base in a way it wouldn't if it was Spanish. So this is why it is an honor today to introduce the Chief Minister of Gibraltar, Fabian Picardo, MP. He is the sixth person to hold the office of Chief Minister, um, but he's actually the seventh Chief Minister because one individual before him held the position twice. He's a native Gibraltarian, and Mr. Picardo um, was raised in Gibraltar and actually later attended Oxford University, where he graduated with a degree in jurisprudence in 1993. He's a barrister by training, and he then attended um, Inns of Court School of Law at Grayson in London and then was called to the bar in 1994. 
After being called to the bar, he moved back to Gibraltar and uh, completed his uh, legal education and then joined Hassan's, which is Gibraltar's largest international law firm. And he was a partner there until his election as chief minister in 2001, or excuse me, 2011. Fabian um, was elected to parliament in Gibraltar in 2003 and um, has, as I said, now risen to the rank of uh, position of chief minister. After um, the chief minister speaks, we'll go to Q&A, um, and there will be microphones handed around, and if you could please state your name and your affiliation before um, you ask your question, that would be most grateful. So please join me in welcoming Fabian Picardo. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for joining us at Heritage this morning. The weather outside is not exactly the sort of weather that I would have gone out in if I had a choice and if I was back home. So thank you very much indeed for making the effort. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to have the opportunity to address you. Uh, and the speech was scheduled before some of the events in the Eastern Mediterranean recently. And I think for the reasons that I'll come to, it may be even more apposite an opportunity to refresh your understanding of why Gibraltar can be significant to the United States. Before I start telling you a little bit about Gibraltar and why it might make a difference to the United States, let me reflect for a moment on what brings me uh, to heritage. Gibraltar, as you will know, sometimes hits the international headlines. No doubt, uh, in nine out of ten, ten of those occasions, it's because of the approach of the Kingdom of Spain and her sovereignty claim over Gibraltar. And last year, of course, was no exception. Uh, in July, the government of Gibraltar created an artificial reef in British sovereign waters just off uh, the rock. And I'll tell you a little bit more about British Gibraltar territorial waters in a while, but that was an act of insisting on... Uh, environmental protection of the area which was being overfished and actually it's worked and turned out to be a quite a useful environmental measure because already a lot more fish have been created and many Spanish fishermen are fishing around it. But the salient aspect of this, the monitoring of the international media that I want to come to is this. We were looking at everything that was being said about Gibraltar at that time. A lot was being published in media around the world. Uh, and something came to our attention in the Huffington Post, the very influential Huffington Post, on the 8th of August uh, of 2013. And it was an article about Gibraltar that betrayed the fact that the author knew a little bit more than most of those who were writing at the time and had a deep level of understanding and knowledge, uh, which was usually uh, not the prevailing level of knowledge that we had seen in the press at the time. It was signed off by a gentleman by the name of Luke Kofi, who I now know. Um, and a similar perspective was taken in a Daily Telegraph blog by a gentleman by the name of Neil Gardner uh, a few weeks uh, later. The face on that blog uh, rang a bell, but I couldn't quite work out what it was. Both of those names, uh, those of you who are involved with Heritage will know, are leading lights in this organization. Niall, it turned out, we were able to work out later, had been at university and in the same college as me at the same time, although we couldn't quite remember each other and we had a mix in the same circles. And Luke had spent a long time in the United Kingdom working in particular for former Shadow Defence Secretary Liam Fox and could therefore understand the Gibraltar issue from the UK perspective. And he was therefore ideally placed to write what he wrote. Since then, I've had the opportunity of welcoming Luke to Gibraltar. Um, and I want to congratulate him for the backgrounder piece that many of you will have, which was published by Heritage, and which is no doubt one of the most influential and most clearly argued um, pieces of writing that I have seen emerge from the United States in relation to the issue of Gibraltar and the uh, history of the relationship between Gibraltar and the United Kingdom. Uh, his opinion is exactly on all fours with the opinion of my government, and I'm grateful for him having taken the time to do that research and reach those conclusions. So that is what brings me to heritage and how I get here. So where and what is Gibraltar? I see some familiar faces in the audience, and I see some faces that will know about Gibraltar, but I see some others that might not. Let me try and help you to refresh your geographic bearings. Gibraltar is a small, rocky peninsula at the southernmost tip of Europe. Uh, 
It's at the entrance to the Mediterranean. In the old days, it would have been really at the crossroads of the ancient world, where the Mediterranean met the Atlantic. The Romans knew it as the non plus ultra. There was nothing known beyond it. And it's therefore been really one of the most important uh, areas of the world for seafarers from the time of Romans and Phoenicians to the time of sophisticated navies that we have today. And in terms of international status, Gibraltar is a British overseas territory, an almost entirely autonomous nation that's on the United Nations list of non-self-governing territories, although we are entirely self-governing in all matters except defense and foreign relations. Ironically, um, all the incumbents of the post of chief minister, I think, have spent most of their time dealing with matters of foreign relations um, since uh, uh, our constitutions retained those aspects of uh, of competence to the United Kingdom. We've been British since 1704 when the United Kingdom took Gibraltar together with an Anglo-Dutch fleet. Um, and in 1713, a treaty was signed known as the Treaty of Utrecht, which is the treaty that uh, Luke just referred to. It was also known as the Treaty of European Peace, almost exactly 301 years ago. So that whirlwind tour tells you where we are and why it is that we are British. But in fact, no longer was the ink dry on the Treaty of European Peace, the Treaty of Utrecht, that Spain started the process of subjecting Gibraltar to further sieges in order to get back that which she had ceded in perpetuity uh, earlier under the Treaty of Utrecht. So even in modern times, after the Second World War, the claim has continued to manifest itself. General Franco at one stage even closed the land frontier with Gibraltar and pursued his claim with absolute venom in his attempt to strangle Gibraltar economically and in that way somehow have a chance of regaining the sovereignty of the rock. We survived that particular siege with a, a very British equivalent of the Berlin airlift where huge support was given to Gibraltar by the United Kingdom. It was a principle of support and sustain that was established to keep Gibraltar British. And of course, by uh, the Kingdom of Morocco, that also hugely supported the United Kingdom and Gibraltar by providing the labor that Spain had withdrawn to operate the Royal Naval Dockyard in Gibraltar. Of course, there are Spanish enclaves in North Africa that Morocco also claims, Melilla and Ceuta, and I express no opinion in respect of those, but in the same way that Spain prosecutes a claim in respect of Gibraltar, Morocco prosecutes a claim in respect of those two. In Gibraltar, and in our context, we've voted in two referenda, in 1967 and in 2002. In the latest of that uh, set of referenda in 2002, the result showed 98.5% expressing a desire to remain British. Now, that might sound Crimean to you, <laughs> but this was no rigged ballot. There was no rigged question. There wasn't anybody standing uh, holding a machine gun around the corner of the polling station. There was no gerrymandering required. That is the genuine expressed view of the people of Gibraltar. And if you went into the streets of Gibraltar and you asked that question, 98.5% of the people you met would likely give you that answer, if not 100%. So in trying to understand how British we feel and why we feel so British, Gibraltar, put it this way, has been British by treaty for 64 years longer than the United States has been independent. And you feel fiercely independent, don't you? We've been British by conquest for 73 years longer than America has been independent and you feel fiercely independent. So imagine how fiercely British we feel. And it's in that context that the people of Gibraltar now believe that they have an important and pivotal role to play in the history of modern Europe and that great synergies can exist between Gibraltar and the United States of America and that can be exploited to mutual benefit, in particular given our membership of the European Union and our access to the single market in services. These commercial opportunities exist alongside our continued strategic military significance to the United Kingdom and, of course, its key ally in that special relationship that Churchill described, the United States. So let's look a little bit at how that historic link with the United States has developed. The special relationship that you hear 
politicians refer to between the United Kingdom and the United States reflects on the relationship that Gibraltar enjoys with the United States. We feel that there is a special bond of trust between us. And the special relationship manifests itself, of course, principally between the United, K the United Kingdom and the United States in relation to military and nuclear matters. And that therefore raises the significance of cooperation on Gibraltar at a military level and the military significance of Gibraltar to the United States as a key United Kingdom asset in the Mediterranean. Excuse me. There's no doubt that Gibraltar's utility as a military base derives principally from our geographical location. And with his permission, I'm now going to quote quite liberally from Luke's work in relation to the history of that relationship in the past 200 years. Luke starts telling us that John Fisher, a former admiral of the fleet of the Royal Navy, described Gibraltar in 1904, only 110 years ago, as one of the five keys that lock up the world. Well, I think it's probably just as true in geographic and military terms today as it was then. All vessels entering or leaving the Mediterranean or going to or from the Atlantic Ocean into the Mediterranean must pass through the Straits of Gibraltar. That made Gibraltar hugely important at the time of the Cold War. Watching the Russian fleet or listening for it if it was coming in under the Straits of Gibraltar was part of what the Cold War was about. Gibraltar today is one of the UK's permanent joint operating bases and serves as an important operating base for the British military which affords a supply location for aircraft and ships destined to Africa, the Middle East, uh, for the UK and her allies. And the port of Gibraltar provides a secure docking area for nuclear-powered submarines. The deep water harbour provides vast amounts of safe anchorage. We have just proudly received in Gibraltar this week, I think she's still there, HMS Astute, the first of the Astute-class nuclear submarines of Her Majesty's Royal Navy. And, of course, Gibraltar has been her first port of call on her maiden operational voyage. Because the United Kingdom operates a Z-berth in Gibraltar's uh, harbour, which is a facility for recreational and non-nuclear repairs uh, at Gibraltar for all nuclear submarines of the Royal Navy fleet. And that makes Gibraltar hugely important to both the United Kingdom and the United States. Going back in history, the first time that the United States had one of its ships call at Gibraltar was in 1801 for the Barbary Wars. In 1818, during the Second Barbary War, when the United States was fighting against the Regency of the Algiers, the United States used Gibraltar's harbor also. In 1899, U.S. Admiral George Dewey stopped in Gibraltar to resupply his ships after his defeat of the Spanish in the Battle of Manila Bay, which was part of the Spanish and American War. In 1909, the Great White Fleet made its final stop in Gibraltar to resupply coal before heading back to the United States during its then-famous round-the-world trip. And then in World War I, the use of Gibraltar really demonstrated its strategic value to the United States. The Royal Navy used Gibraltar as its base for Mediterranean operations from the beginning of that war. Gibraltar was a crucial meeting point for many Allied convoy convoys before crossing the Atlantic. The U.S. Navy and the U.S. Coast Guard joined British forces at Gibraltar and operated together as part of the so-called Gibraltar Barrage. But perhaps the greatest presence of American assets in Gibraltar occurred, of course, during the Second World War. And it was during that conflict that Gibraltar's importance was highlighted in defense of freedom and democracy in the face of advancing Nazi fascism across Europe and much of the world. You'll recall, of course, that during the Second World War, Gibraltar was the only part of continental Europe that did not fall to the Axis or was not otherwise uh, pretending to be neutral. And Operation Torch, the taking of North Africa, was planned by General Eisenhower, then President Eisenhower from Gibraltar, where he had his base of operations inside the rock. It was a great opportunity for me uh, to ensure that uh, Luke understood the significance of Gibraltar, to ensure that he went to see that place when he was in Gibraltar. And I would invite you all to come to Gibraltar to see where President Eisenhower had his headquarters, literally inside the heart of the rock during the Second World War. 
As an aside, let me tell you that my now deceased father was a despatch rider during that war, and he would regale me with stories when I was a little boy of this man who then went on to become president, whose letters he used to take to the governor in the center of our city. The airfield in Gibraltar was developed at about that time, and Eisenhower tells us that at the time of the Second World War, there was not place, there was not room to keep another can of oil in that airfield. It was covered in Allied military aircraft. In his book, Crusade in Europe, Eisenhower put it this way, and I think it's worth quoting his words. There was no other place to use. In November 1942, the Allied nations possessed, except for the Gibraltar Fortress, not a single spot of ground in all the region of Western Europe and in the Mediterranean area. Nothing west of Malta. Britain's Gibraltar made possible the invasion of northwest Africa. Without it, the vital air cover would not have been quickly established on the North African fields. I think he put it better than I ever could. The use of Gibraltar during the Second World War was, of course, only possible because it was not under Spanish control, as Spain was pretending to be neutral in that conflict. And again, of course, thereafter, in the Cold War that followed the descent of the Iron Curtain that Churchill described, Gibraltar was equally significant for the reasons that we've discussed. <clears throat> I remember whilst I was at school, uh, not that long ago, excuse me, <coughs> only about 25 years, <laughs> that we used to look at the areas that the Russians were targeting. This is what a common map that we would look at in school. And Gibraltar, we were very proud, was targeted by the Russians for nuclear attack in the event of Armageddon occurring. <laughs> just like London and just like Washington and New York, you know, that was the level of importance that the enemies of freedom of democracy in that time ascribed to Gibraltar. They too saw the significance to the allies of this small military base in the entrance to the Mediterranean. Before I move on to the more modern aspects of the relationship between the United Kingdom and Gibraltar. Let me just tell you that I've been told very recently there's a very uh, recent discovery of a Liberator aircraft of the United States Air Force that appears to have gone down during the Second World War in operations off Gibraltar Airport. We know that there were three Liberators that went down. One of them was carrying General Sikorsky, the president of the people of Poland, who died just off Gibraltar. We recently celebrated the anniversary of his passing. Another was Liberator Bomber AL-516 that has not been found. The third Liberator Bomber that went down, and it appears to be the one that has been identified by the Gibraltar Museum, was Liber Liberator Bomber AM-911. And the government of Gibraltar will be working with the museum in Gibraltar to try and bring Liberator Bomber AM-911 out of the sea and put it on permanent exhibition, if possible, in Gibraltar as an exhibit of the relationship between Gibraltar and the people of the United States and the effect of the United States' work during the Second World War off Gibraltar to ensure the recovery of North Africa and thereafter the freedom of Europe. So after the Cold War, after the Second World War, in a world which is modern and which is civilized and when we are hopefully not having to keep each other in our sights permanently, what could be the significance of Gibraltar? Well, of course, we understand that the east-west polarization could become a north-west polarization with the rise of Islamic fundamentalism in sub-Saharan Africa and in the Middle East. Gibraltar remains, of course, on the front line in that respect. On a good day, we can see the cars circulating on the North African coast with the naked eye, without the need for uh, binoculars. More recently, in Operation El Dorado Canyon, in 1986, the United States airstrikes on Libya involved the use of Gibraltar port and airport. In 1990 and 1991, an estimated 193 US Navy ships traversed British Gibraltar territorial waters in support operations of Desert Storm. The US nuclear submarines continue to frequently visit the berths at Gibraltar, although it's been some time since we've seen one of your guys there. And the recent intervention in Libya when two U.S. attack submarines, USS Florida and USS Providence, were resupplied at Gibraltar <coughs> after launching their cruise missiles against Libyan targets emphasizes the continued modern importance of Gibraltar to the United States. But as North Africa becomes more of a security issue every day for the United States due to the growing terrorist presence, Gibraltar, I put it to you, becomes even more important. 
In modern times, Gibraltar has remained a staging post for the free fleets of the United Kingdom and, of course, continues to hold joint operations base, um, which the United Kingdom makes available to the United States. But we're not just there for the United Kingdom as a civilian population. We don't just welcome those uh, forces of the UK. We're also there for her allies. Um, we therefore frequently receive in Gibraltar visits of the United States Mediterranean fleet and from the part of the civilian population. My role is to tell you that you are very, very welcome in Gibraltar. They are as welcome as the military assets of the United Kingdom because Gibraltar understands the importance of the special relationship. Gibraltar has never tried to persuade the United Kingdom to turn away a movement of US naval assets. It's not in our gift as a civilian government of Gibraltar to become involved in military operations, but it is not our desire in any event to do anything other than extend a very warm welcome indeed to any part of the US Navy or her armed forces that might wish to visit Gibraltar upon an invitation extended by the United Kingdom. It's a place where you'll find an Anglo-Saxon mentality which is not seeking transactional relationships in any way. We know that there is no global security without the UK and the United States, and we are grateful. The jurisdictional aspects that Gibraltar offers the United States also cannot be underestimated. That Anglo-Saxon aspect to the jurisdiction at a key strategic location that works under an umbrella of rule of law that you understand is one that I put it to you is very useful to the United States just off the coast of North Africa. There's no need for excessive cultural translation. We are like you. We understand the world like you understand the world. And we therefore understand Gibraltar's continued strategic significance even in a more modern world. But we're not just a strategic military asset. Gibraltar can also be important to the United States commercially. We're a center already for international commerce and in some ways almost pivotal. We have a highly regulated financial services sector that is praised by the OECD and the IMF for its regulatory standards. We enjoy a full tax information exchange agreement with the United States, signed by my predecessor as Chief Minister with your Head of the Treasury, Mr. Timothy Geithner, and we comply fully with all European Union regulation. For example, Gibraltar is a full part of the European Union as a territory of the European Union for which a member state of the European Union is responsible, named the United Kingdom. We therefore have obligations to transpose into Gibraltar law as a separate European jurisdiction all rules and directives of the EU. And we do that, giving us unrestricted access to the single market in services provided to the 520 million people of the EU. In fact, Gibraltar is probably one of the very few European Union jurisdictions that can claim that all European Union laws which require transposition have been transposed into Gibraltar law before the deadline for doing so. We are a fully compliant EU jurisdiction. And that culture of compliance, which pervades everything that Gibraltar does in respect of any organization to which we belong, enables us to have the support of British Prime Minister Cameron in his push against some jurisdictions which might have been less transparent and non-compliant. Indeed, since 1994, 20 years ago now, Gibraltar has been one of the leaders in the international fight against money laundering and the prevention of the use of the financial system for the laundering of the proceeds of all crimes. And we don't just do financial services. We're not just an important military asset of the United Kingdom and therefore the United States. Gibraltar is also the largest jurisdiction in the world, the most successful jurisdiction in the world in the provision of online gaming services. Online gaming is one of the most burgeoning parts of e-commerce, and Gibraltar is at the forefront of that. Many territories may have thousands of online casinos registered on their books. Some of them have hundreds registered on the books. Gibraltar has only 26, but they are the 26 biggest operators in the world, the 26 most reputable operators in the world, and subject to the most stringent regulation in the world. Because when you're dealing with online gaming and when people are giving their money over the internet to place a bet, the most important relationship is one of trust between those who are placing a stake and those who are going to repay that stake and winnings if there is a win. 
And because Gibraltar is so highly regulated, the most highly regulated online gaming jurisdiction in the world, it has become the place of choice for the leading operators in the world. Almost 60% of all bets taken in the United Kingdom are taken through Gibraltar operators. So when the United States took the decision, some way through, halfway through the past decade, to not allow bets to be taken in the United States from outside each of the states, it was an interpretation of the Department of Justice of the U.S. Wire Act, Gibraltar was one of, if not the only jurisdiction in the world to require its operators not to take bets in the United States. Many other jurisdictions allowed their operators to continue taking bets in the United States in breach of the U.S. rules. Gibraltar actually required the operators to stop taking bets. That is how highly regulated the industry is in Gibraltar, and that is how respectful of the United States' own regulation Gibraltar always has been. So, in that context, I put it to you that Gibraltar can be a hugely important commercial stepping stone to United States companies that want to operate within the European Union. We are a low-tax jurisdiction. We have 10% of corporate tax in Gibraltar. In the region of the taxation applied in Ireland and Luxembourg and Malta. But of those, we are the only common law jurisdiction on the southern end of Europe without value added taxation applied as a result of a derogation negotiated by the United Kingdom at the time of accession of, into the European Union in 1972 of Gibraltar with the UK. So you have businesses in the United States that may be considering how best to access the European Union. Where else would they find a jurisdiction that is friendly to the US military, that speaks English as the official language of the territory, that is subject to the principles of the common law, that has a low tax regime where VAT is not payable and yet gives you full access to the European single market in services? Only Gibraltar. And today, the United States drives Gibraltar to a very great extent. Why do I say that? Because my official car is no longer a Jaguar. It's a Tesla crafted in California. It used to cost about 80 pounds to fuel uh, the Jaguar with uh, petrol. It cost 40 pence to fill the Tesla every night when we connect it to the grid. The best of American ingenuity. Our online gaming is driven in part by ingenuity from the United States. Gibraltar was uh, partnered by Ninex of New York in fitting a fiber network in Gibraltar, which enables us to offer these online gaming companies the resilience that they need, the best of American expertise. And our ship repair, repair facility, which used to be the Royal Navy docks in Gibraltar, are now owned and operated by an, Amer an American investment fund out of New York. American financial engineering delivering real engineering success on the ground. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you that at a human, a commercial, and at a military level, we must now further strengthen the ties that bind the American people and the British people of Gibraltar. Let the special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States continue to deliver a special bond of trust between the people of Gibraltar and the people of the United States. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to take your questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Fabian, for that. Um, clearly, you speak with conviction and passion on this issue, and that's something that anyone would want their, uh, their leadership to do. And it's very, very clear that you're a staunch defender of the special relationship of sovereignty and of self-determination, which are three principles that we hold very dearly here at the Heritage Foundation. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to open the floor now to questions. We have some time. Uh, I'm going to actually ask the first question. Um, as a former uh, U.S. soldier who served in Europe, I know that at times the local population may not be very welcoming um, to your presence. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe speak on, on how your average Gibraltarian <coughs> might perceive or view the presence of a U.S. Uh, naval ship arriving into port and how they might um, either be welcoming or accommodate, that sort of thing. Thank you. 
Well, I know that you have other bases around the world, and when you turn up at other bases around the world, um, things are not e exactly uh, positive in every instance. For example, when you use some of your bases in Spain, you're asked by the Spanish government to give details of where your assets have been and where they're going, etc. Uh, when you turn up at Gibraltar, the only thing the civilian population of Gibraltar asks you is, what would you like to drink? <laughs> and if you go into any of our pubs, um, and there are many of them, um, you might find that they are principally decorated with caps and photographs of uh, British military uh, vessels that have called at Gibraltar, uh, British uh, nuclear submarines, and American ships that have called at Gibraltar. And we, we haven't stolen those caps. <laughs> we haven't had a quarrel with anyone to try and steal them away. They are actually donated by the ships that come and help decorate our our pubs in that way. You are very, very welcome in Gibraltar. There is absolutely no hostility whatsoever to the uh, military personnel of the United Kingdom, of the United States, or of any other allies that are invited by the United Kingdom to use Gibraltar's military base. And I think the civilian authorities reflect that welcome, and the civilian population reflects that welcome as well in the approach that they take to you when, when they see you in uniform down Main Street or not in uniform, uh, enjoying the pleasures that Gibraltar affords. Usually, um, you may come to Gibraltar on the way to a long deployment or after a long deployment, and you know, one understands that you need a drink yes. at times like that. Thank you. All right, um, if I could ask you to please identify yourself um, and uh, do I have any, uh, yes, gentlemen. Thank you. My name is Hermes Levy. I'm from the OWS. And my question is uh, uh, to ask uh, can you a little bit elaborate about uh, the, uh, the 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 treaty that uh, by which the Spain uh, decided to definitely seize uh, uh, to, to liberate uh, Gibraltar, and then why they come back to start that to ask for it? Well, the, the treaty that we're referring to is the Treaty of Utrecht. It's a treaty that was signed in 1713. And it wasn't about Gibraltar. It was actually about the whole of Europe. And Europe at that time had been characterized by cannon and bloodshed was the way that disputes were resolved. Um, and this was really the first step towards trying to resolve issues in a different way. It's called the Treaty of Utrecht because it was signed at Utrecht, but its long name, as I told you before, is the Treaty of European Peace. Now, um, what happened in that treaty uh, is reflected in relation to Gibraltar in, rela in Article 10 of the treaty, and in effect it's a cessation of the treaty. Spain cedes the uh, territory of Gibraltar to the United Kingdom in perpetuity as a result of that agreement. But it was an early attempt at European peace, and no sooner was the ink dry that Spain was trying to retake Gibraltar. But the treaty doesn't just deal with Gibraltar, as between the United Kingdom and Spain, there are other sessions and there are other concessions made. Now, all of that means that there is today a treaty which the United Kingdom and Spain continue to consider as valid, which the people of Gibraltar have some issues with, which creates a treaty right to the territory of Gibraltar, <coughs> which is not the case in relation to some of the other territories that the United Kingdom holds, which it has taken by conquest. Here there is actually a treaty in relation to the city and garrison of Gibraltar. Now, Spain's uh, approach to the treaty is twofold. It says that the territory of Gibraltar beyond the city walls to the north, which is the isthmus, was not ceded and is therefore not part of the area she recognizes as having been ceded under the treaty. And that because the treaty is silent as to the waters around Gibraltar, she does not recognize that waters were ceded to Gibraltar and therefore all waters inside the port are British, but the waters outside the port are not British. Now, let me try and analyze that for you for a moment. I have yet to find a treaty of 1713 or around that time that ceded waters. And treaties that Spain has, which ceded the territory to it at the time, did not cede it waters specifically. This was not done in treaties at the time. And yet Spain has no issue with claiming the waters around Menorca, for example. We all know that at that time, title to waters was really 
uh, driven by something called, um, unglamorously, the cannon shot rule, which operated on the principle that if my cannon could reach you, then it was my water, and you stayed out of it, unless you were invited to come into it. And this is how actually the international rule developed, and today it's still called the cannon shot rule. In the first uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, signed in 1958, the world started to take a different approach to the possession of territorial sea. And the concept of the three miles of territorial sea extendable to 12 miles was first introduced. The United Kingdom came, claimed for Gibraltar the, uh, 12, the, the three mile limit and the, the principles of half of the Bay of Gibraltar, which would determine how to delineate where British Gibraltar territorial water started and ended. And Spain obviously doesn't accept that as entered a reservation in that respect in the 1958 treaty and subsequently in the 1982 treaty as well, the Montego Bay Convention, which is the current United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The effect of that reservation is not in any way to confirm Spain's uh, right to that water because the reservation does not have the effect as against any party of creating a new regime in respect of the water other than the regime that the convention creates. So it's a complex area. But uh, to look at Spain's approach, for example, let me give you uh, another couple of examples. The port in Gibraltar today is much larger than the port in Gibraltar in 1713. And yet Spain recognizes the whole of the new port as the area which is controlled by Britain. But of course, that is miles outside the, the port as it used to be in 1713. On the eastern side of Gibraltar, there is no port. And therefore, Spain argues that Gibraltar has no waters to the east. That means every time I go for a swim on our beaches off the east side, I need to take my passport with me. And there should be somebody there to check that I'm not taking anything into what is Spain. Now, if those arguments had any validity and were not quite as ridiculous as they obviously are, we might have to talk about something. Uh, these arguments have absolutely no validity in international law. They are arguments advanced politically, which have to be dealt with politically. The European Commission has recently found that some reclamation works done on the east side of Gibraltar were properly done by the government of Gibraltar. They were done in keeping with European Union law, and importantly, the party that was entitled to make those determinations was the government of Gibraltar. That demonstrates that even the EU recognizes that that water to the east of Gibraltar must be British Gibraltar territorial water, otherwise the proper party to determine um, whether the European Union rules had been observed would have been Spain. So you know, there are some instances where Spain is being flushed out on its uh, uh, approach. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is a very good a front page of ABC newspaper, which is a right-wing uh, newspaper in Spain of the 1960s, which shows how General Franco had delineated the airspace around Gibraltar. Now, international scholars will tell you that airspace and territorial sea are almost identical. And he had set out um, using the boundaries of the territorial water where the uh, air of, around Gibraltar could be accessed by British aircraft and where it could not. Even General Franco, therefore, I put it to you, recognized Gibraltar's waters. And unfortunately, its modern governments want to go back to arguments that really hold no water, if you'll excuse the pun. <laughs> um, the gentleman uh, back, you, yes, you, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Yuri Sigov, uh, US Bureau Chief of uh, Abroad Magazine. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Minister about the current status of dialogue with Spain. There are many differences, many problems, but is there any direct dialogue between Gibraltar and Spain? And also about the relations of Gibraltar with your another neighbor, Morocco, mm -hmm. just across the strait and uh, how you're dealing with them. Thank you. Well, there is no dialogue at present between Gibraltar and Spain. Uh, and there hasn't been in many years dialogue between Gibraltar and Spain. I mean, the history um, of the dispute with Spain since the 1960s has been littered with many years of there being absolutely no contact between the government of Gibraltar and the government of Spain. 
Recently, in 2005-2006, the Spanish Socialist government took a completely different approach to that historically taken by successive Spanish governments and opened a channel of communication that recognized the right of the people of Gibraltar to be involved in discussions about any aspect of their future. That trilateral forum created the Cordoba Agreements of 2006 that led to the resolution of many of the historic issues that affected the lives of people of both sides of the frontiers, issues relating to pensions, the use of the airport, the extension of telephone lines available to Gibraltar, etc. Unfortunately, the Spanish Partido Popular administration in November 2011 formally ended that process, or at least attempted to. There are still uh, many parties in Spain that continue to advocate in favor of the trilateral process, and the government of the United Kingdom has said it continues to strongly believe in the trilateral forum, as has my government. So therefore, of the three parties that made up the trilateral forum, two remain at the table, and one has walked away. Of the three parties that entered into the Cordoba Agreements of 2006, two continue to perform their obligations thereunder, and one has unilaterally decided not to perform its obligations. Let me give you an example that is current. Under the 2006 Cordoba Agreement on pensions, the United Kingdom took on the obligation to pay uprated pensions to Spanish people who had been working in Gibraltar before 1969 when General Franco closed the frontier. The United Kingdom has made payments in excess of £75 million already to such Spanish pensioners, and continues to pay. Although Spain has unilaterally withdrawn from the Cordoba agreements and is now acting in breach of those agreements in respect of the inclusion of Gibraltar airport in European air liberalization measures. So Spain and Gibraltar don't just remain at the table ready to talk. We are continuing to perform our side of the obligations that we undertook under the 2006 Cordoba agreements, and Spain unilaterally under its present Partido Popular government has withdrawn from its performance of its obligations. I think you judge people by how they perform on their agreements. Despite this, the Foreign Secretary William Hague has tried to build a bridge to have ad hoc dialogue with Spain on issues that matter to people on both sides of the frontier, on issues relating to good neighborly relations. We have supported the Foreign Secretary in that respect, and in April 2012, he wrote to Foreign Minister Margallo, putting to him the framework of what these ad hoc talks could be in, with the support of the government of Gibraltar. Since then, there have been exchanges of correspondence on the issue. The latest is with Spain, and they have not yet been able to agree a framework where they might be able to sit down with us, with the people who are relevant and competent to the issues that we might discuss. They are insisting on simply having what they call quadrilateral dialogue instead of trilateral dialogue involving the Junta de Andalusia, so that in some way, therefore, the competence of the government of Gibraltar is diminished to that of the Junta de Andalusia. Look, I think the Junta de Andalusia is a fantastic organization that does an excellent job, controls a budget larger than the government of Gibraltar, and is responsible for the lives of many people in Andalusia, many more than the government of Gibraltar is responsible for. But it is an emanation of the Spanish state. It is within the definition of Spain. Gibraltar is not within the definition of United Kingdom and has different constitutional competences to the Junta de Andalusia. I would be delighted to sit down with the Junta de Andalusia to discuss any items which are within its competence, but not issues which were relevant under the trilateral forum. And it may be that under the ad hoc forum, the Junta de Andalusia is relevant to some of the things that we have to discuss, but so might others be. And there are some things where the Junta de Andalusia might not be competent, but might not have constitutional competence, and the only competent parties might be the United Kingdom, Spain, and Gibraltar. The Chevening Agreement done before the Trilateral Agreement in 2005 made clear that the fact that Gibraltar sat at the trilateral table with Spain and the United Kingdom did not elevate Gibraltar to the same status as Spain and the United Kingdom. You would have thought you didn't need an agreement to be told that. But there is a formal agreement in order to ensure that Spain was satisfied that somehow Gibraltar was not being elevated into the status of an independent nation. So that is what the state of relations is. The United Kingdom and Gibraltar would like to have ad hoc talks with Spain. Spain is not coming to terms with us in a way that preserves all parties' red lines to ensure that we can have those talks. The United Kingdom and Gibraltar remain ready to have talks under the trilateral forum for dialogue. I'm very confident that we see a government in Spain. It is very likely that the trilateral may restart. 
Um, there were accusations by some on the Spanish left even that my predecessor wanted to discuss issues of sovereignty during the course of the trilateral. I have absolutely no desire whatsoever to discuss any issue of sovereignty with Spain in or out of the trilateral so they can have uh, that guarantee. You asked me also about relations with the Kingdom of Morocco to the south. We have excellent relations with the Kingdom of Morocco. In the 1960s, as I told you, they provided the labor that enabled the United Kingdom to continue to operate the dockyard at Gibraltar. Some of those people have now remained in Gibraltar. They've been in Gibraltar for almost 50 years. When I was elected, many of them who had been there for 45, 50 years, longer than I've been alive, did not even have the right to vote. And I had the right to ask people to choose me as their chief minister. So since then, I've ensured that I've recommended them all for British nationality. And many of them are now British citizens and have all the rights that um, other Gibraltarians would have extended to them. That has built a strong bond at a human level between Gibraltar and Morocco. There are very strong commercial ties also with Morocco. And one of the things I introduced when I was elected was a visa waiver regime for Moroccans visiting Gibraltar. So long as they had a Schengen multiple entry visa, Gibraltar would not require any further visa to enter Gibraltar. That has worked extraordinarily well. The last time I checked, we'd already had 5,000 visitors uh, in the few months since I'd introduced that measure. We have time for two more questions, and we had two hands. So first the gentleman here, and then the gentleman in the back row there. Um, the mic's coming. Is it okay to take two, the final sure. two together? So um, we'll take them both together, and then the chief minister will answer. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gonzalo Quintero. I'm a political counselor in the Embassy of Spain here in Washington. And I would thank very much the Heritage Foundation to hold a similar meeting in which my embassy and my government will be able to express its own views against this long issue standing between the United Kingdom and Spain. And thank you very much for the presence of uh, Mr. Picardo here. It's always very clear. We do not share, of course, most of the things that have been said here, but we would like for that the opportunity to have a longer session in which our views can be put forward. Thank you very much. If I may say so, may I thank Gonzalo for that intervention. Um, I'm getting used to him saying this after I give speeches <laughs> in the United States. Um, and it would be my pleasure to hear the position of the government of Spain um, expressed with some clarity. Um, and in fact, what I would do is I would invite Heritage not just to have um, another, another boring speech. I, I get tired of hearing myself speak. Let's have a debate on the issues. It would be my pleasure to have the opportunity to debate um, Gonzalo or any of his uh, political masters on this issue so that we can really ventilate the issues clearly and have the opportunity to let people decide um, whether might is right or whether there's some logic in what I'm saying. And then the gentleman there. Hello, Charlie Carson. Um, you talked in detail about how Gibraltar is very welcoming to the US, but how is the US welcoming to British sovereignty in Gibraltar? Well, thank you for, for the opportunity to address that specific question because to an extent uh, that's where we're driving by explaining how welcoming we have been of the US military because of our relationship with the United Kingdom. The importance, therefore, should be implicit to the US of, the, of how important it is to keep Gibraltar British so that the welcome remains a very positive British welcome. We've analyzed some of the way that Spain has acted in the past when the United States has been involved in conflict. And although, of course, Spain offers the United States uh, areas which the United States uses as military bases, Spain has an independent foreign policy that may be contrary to United States foreign policy in some instances. United States foreign policy and UK foreign policy tend to be more closely linked than US foreign policy and Spanish foreign policy, and therefore it's more likely that Gibraltar would be available as a key military asset to the United States whilst it remained subject to the United Kingdom sovereignty and United Kingdom uh, foreign policy imperatives. Now, now, apart from that, what does the United States stand for? It stands for freedom and liberty, and it preaches the principles of democracy around the world. So I put to you that you have an area of land which belongs to 30,000 people. You ask them whether they want to be British, Spanish, or anything else, the United States should be defending their right to determine their future freely and democratically. Well, please join me in thanking the Chief Minister.
Um, thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come here and address the Heritage Foundation. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And also thank you to our online viewers. Uh, the, the speech will be available online within 24 hours for your viewing at heritage.org. Um, there will be sandwiches outside with soft drinks um, for the audience. And just a reminder, today at the Heritage Foundation is a very big day for the special relationship. Not only do we have the honor of Fabian Picardo, the Chief Minister of Gibraltar, but at 1.30, uh, the British Defense Secretary, Philip Hammond, will be speaking here. So if you have the time, hang around and come back for that event at 1.30. So um, for one last time, again, please join me in thanking Fabian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.